praise the Lord. We give the Lord thanks for bringing us here another time in the house of the Lord. We will open up our Bible to the book of John, John chapter 18, and today we will pick up from verse 7. We bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here another time as we congregate today in your house. We pray that the Spirit of God will assemble with us. God, you'll pour out your Spirit upon us in a fresh and mighty way. Anoint us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Place a hunger and a thirst within our hearts for your words today, Lord. Heal our lands, heal our bodies, our soul, our mind, our spirit. Help us to be focused upon you, Lord. Bless those who are on their way. Let this be a joyous time of celebration in your house today, we pray. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, your son. Praise the Lord. All right, so we are picking up from John chapter 18. And today we find ourselves in from verse 7. Now we continue to talk about Jesus. He was about to be arrested. And uh, Judas came um, with a band of soldiers. And also he had uh, police officers from the temple. And as we studied last week, it was a band of soldiers that ranged from 200 to, you know, maybe seven or thousand, 700 or 1,000 soldiers that was there because uh, it was Passover season. And uh, the Roman authority, they were always prepared just in case there was any kind of an insurrection from the Jewish people because at that time the Jewish people they were under the control of the Romans and uh, when there is a Passover season there are you know, close to 3 million people coming in from outside uh, and you know, Israel in Jerusalem so they always uh, at, at, on guard to, just in case there is any kind of a disturbance among the Jewish people. So it was during the time of Passover that Jesus was arrested. Jesus went to the garden. You remember where we uh, left off there last week? He went to the garden of Gethsemane. And while he was there, well, John didn't record to us and tell us when he prayed and he prayed and his sweat became as drops of blood falling down to the ground. But other parts of the gospel, we will find that uh, be narrated. But uh, what we are having here is that these uh, soldiers came, and uh, Judas came with a band of soldiers, and uh, uh, he, I guess you will find in the other part of the gospel where he gave Jesus a kiss to identify who he was. And in verse 8 we pick up, Then asked he them again, Whom seek he? So they came to arrest Jesus, and uh, Jesus is asking the question to uh, the soldiers and the temple police, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. In verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. So here we see that Jesus wasn't afraid to be um, arrested. He wasn't uh, resisting arrest. He wasn't hiding out. Remember uh, all your verses we read where they came with uh, lanterns and torches uh, just in case uh, um, Jesus tried to escape in the middle of the night, they came prepared so that they can find him. But he wasn't um, preparing to run away from them. He voluntarily surrendered himself to them. But if you notice what he was doing here in verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. And if, uh, if therefore you seek me, let these go their way. So Jesus surrendered to um, the soldiers and uh, he is commanding or he um, issued a command to them to let his disciples go. He didn't want his disciples to be taken into custody because had they take these disciples into custody, there was a possibility that they might have tried to execute the disciples also. So Jesus being a good shepherd, as the Bible said, he laid down his life for his sheep. He was going all the way to make sure that his disciples was secure. 
And uh, verse 9 tells us that the saying might be fulfilled, which he, sp he speak, of them which thou givest me, have I lost none. So Jesus is saying here, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. By him um, protecting his uh, disciple, disciples, it, it fulfilled prophecy that of all that the Lord gave to him, he lost none. You remember we make mention about, he, he, he spake that um, scripture before, and he uh, make reference to an exception. He said, except one, the son of perdition, which was Judas. So Jesus made sure that all of his disciples was protected from harm. And uh, he tried to safeguard them and to make sure that they were saved uh, from, you know, whatever evil these soldiers might, you know, try to bring upon them. He made sure that they were protected and all of that was in fulfillment of scripture. And now it tells us in verse 10, uh, then Simon Peter having a sword, draw it. Now we are in John chapter uh, 18 and we are in verse 10. Then Simon Peter having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his, ear, his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So all of these soldiers over there came to arrest Jesus and Jesus surrendered to them. There was no resistance on the part of Jesus. All he did, he gave a commandment that they let his disciples go free. And Peter, uh, to show his um, zeal and to show how dedicated and committed he was. I remember it was that same night Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to um, deny him three times. And Peter said, no, he's not gonna, that's not going to happen. Peter said that he rather die than to um, deny the Lord. So here we see that Peter, with all of his zeal, and we could also call it courage, although his zeal and his courage was misdirected because he did not really fully understood what Jesus came to do because Jesus came to die. And Jesus really didn't need Peter to defend him. Um, he said that he had power or authority to call 12 legions of soldiers to protect him. And uh, 12 legions of soldiers, one legion, it is believed, is about 6,000 soldiers. So Jesus is saying that he had within his power to call 72,000 uh, soldiers, uh, uh, not soldiers, um, angels, to defend him. And uh, we, we, we know when you read in the Old Testament, you saw where um, one angel in the Old Testament destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Could you imagine if Jesus should call 12 legions of soldiers, 72,000 soldiers? I was reading where one commentator was saying, at that time, if you calculated one soldier, one angel in Old Testament time, destroy 185,000 soldiers, right? If Jesus should call um, 72,000 angels, all of the people in the world at that time would still not be enough to face up against all of those um, angels that the Lord could have called. But he did not call. The, 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 the song said he could have called 10,000 angels but he died to, to destroy the world, but he died alone. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, this, this verse, I, I don't know. Because if God himself, Jesus Christ, is, he said he is God, which mm -hmm. we all believe that he is God. Right. And now that he's talking about, okay, calling angels. When, you, when, you, when you're dealing with God, you talk about the supernatural power, something that we can't even, we can't, human beings can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. And now you're calling for physical force. Which is, um, he could have called 10,000 angels. So I find that, not that little, find that a little exaggerating in, in terms of Jesus Christ as God? Uh, no, well, I don't think so. Because, see, uh, what we, had, uh, we have to understand, I know what you're saying, that Jesus could have do it himself, right? Because if he is God, he could do it himself. But we have to understand that um, he is over all of these angels. These angels are servant to him. So instead of, he could do it himself. 
But instead of he do it himself, he can use his servant. I think he's just showing them the kind of authority that he has. You know, even though he could do it himself, he can dispatch um, his um, servant to do that. So, uh, you know, I won't really say it's um, exaggeration. Yes, he could have done it. Go ahead, brother. I think, I think he, he's trying to make a comparison, mm. right? In that they brought the soldiers, okay, mm. to arrest him right. in the thousands. And he is saying, well, you bring soldiers, but I, I can call soldiers too, yeah, you know, could, yes. to, the, to, to match you. Right. But I ain't doing it. But that's, mm. a good, that's a good point because, as I said, there's a, because uh, at that time, uh, the Roman garrison, they used to keep a lot of soldiers. They never used to send out these soldiers unless they're going out. They, when they're going out, when they leave their barracks and they're going out, the least amount of soldiers or men they will go with is 200. What they're saying is that that group of um, men, they usually number up to 1,000. And as I said before, it was a time in Jerusalem when they were having the Passover and there was millions of people Jewish people who, were, who came in for this Passover. And around that time, Jewish people, they expect their Messiah to come, and they were under the control of the Roman government. And, uh, you know, they always have some kind of disturbance. So when, when uh, um, Judas went to the high priest and collect these soldiers, they went out with full force. I believe that they went out with full force of men expecting that some kind of disturbance will happen. Because as we said last week, Jesus was loved by the people. And if you notice what they did, they did not arrest Jesus when he was in Jerusalem. They arrested him when he was on the outside. The Garden of Gethsemane is not in the heart of Jerusalem where all these people were gathering. Because had they did that, the people might have put up some resistance. And that's right, Judas chose that spot. Jesus' favorite spot where he does go to pray and it's a quiet place. That's the reason why he chose that spot. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, but Pastor, but look at it. Like there was, it seemed as though they was expecting something to happen because look at Peter had a sword, right? Like Peter was armed. But if you go back to the other part there, okay, when the, um, when the children of Israel came from Egypt and they opposed Moses in the, in the um, wilderness, right. God has opened up the earth yeah. and they saw all his people. Right, yes. Yeah, yes, so, yes. so that's, that's the point I'm making here. But here, the Bible says that he could have called 10,000 angels. So it's like they was expecting something. Look at Peter, drew, drew his sword, and he cut off the, 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 um, the cypress of Well, you see, Jesus, when he came at that time, he didn't come to destroy anybody. You know? He didn't come to um, destroy anybody. You know, even when he was on the cross, they make fun of him, mock him, and tell him, well, if he's the son of God, save himself, come down and save himself and save others. He, at that time, he, he, he restrained he restrained himself. He could have done. He could have done all of the things that they were expecting him to do. All what you say in there, he was capable of doing that. But at that time, when he came, he didn't really come to do that, you know. And uh, <laughs> but the next time he returned, people, uh, I guess, just like how they was expecting him to do certain things and he don't do it, people will not expect him to do certain things. And those, that is the time that he's going to do it. Amen. He's not going to come like no, that little Jesus, meek and mild. He's going to come as a, a, a general, that according to what Revelation say, he'll be riding on a, on a horse and he will come to take um, revenge, vengeance upon the people of the world who reject him. So um, it, it tells us, um, it, well, I, I, um, the, the, I, I should comment on what uh, the elders said there too. He said that Peter had um, a sword. And what he's saying is that um, the disciples, they were prepared for war. Um, what, yes, what he, he have a point there. But what happened is that those disciples, they mistook what Jesus was saying. In other parts of the um, gospel, Jesus told them that because of the fact that he was going away, those who don't have a sword, they must sell their, their garment and buy a sword. But they physically thought that Jesus was saying to go out and get weapons. But Jesus, some of the, some of the time, he talked in this kind of, uh, he used this kind of parable. But they mistook what he was saying. But what he was saying is that time is going to change. And uh, the, the quiet time that they're having, 
that while he was there, that's not going to continue. The, the, the people of the world, the sword of, from the people of the world is going to be against them. But at no time at all, Jesus ever um, warned his disciples to pick up weapons. They, they thought he was going to do that because um, when a Messiah come, they thought that the Messiah was going to have army and have, you know, people who was going to defend him. Yeah. You know, but Jesus didn't really come to do that. So, yes, what the brothers said they, is true. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ saw them with the sword, right? Yeah. He could have said, okay, is that not what I mean? Leave your sword home. Mm-hmm. But he, apparently he allowed them to, to carry the sword along with him. Well, why, why did he allow them to carry the sword? Well, there's a lot of things that happened when Jesus was there that we don't have explanation for. For instance, we, we asked the question, why did Jesus allow um, Judas to be the treasurer when he knew that he was stealing money from the treasury? And we don't know why. We don't know why. So we don't, the Bible never tells us, you know, why Jesus, knowing that, because I know, as you said, he, he knew that he had sword. I don't know if any other, any other disciple had sword also. But he knew that Peter had a sword. But th- there is no way where he, he tells us that the scripture tells us that Jesus warned him, you know, except for what we come into now. But, uh, you know, as I said, they, they, they totally mistook what Jesus was saying. Jesus never really mean for them to go out and get weapons, you know, no, he never really was encouraging them to go out and get weapons. Pastor. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say, for example, we're all a peaceful men here, peaceful Christians. Right. And let's say, okay, then um, we go going on uh, maybe some extra exp- expedition and I have my gun. Mm-hmm. Because a sword was considered like, um, to, to the, like well, a gun it's a, today. Weapon. It's a weapon. It's a weapon, right. right. So now they, 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 they already um, canceled the sword and now they, they improve. They have, they have guns now, real sophisticated weapon now that could spray on people after a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, but just have, it, have his gun. And you know that I also say, brother, well, why are you doing with the gun? You're going to leave it home. I don't believe that because God, Christ, know, God knows everything. Because it is an a, a, a offensive weapon. You say, okay, leave it home. Leave your gun home. It's dangerous. Oh. <laughs> well, well, maybe, you see, we, we speculate in it. But maybe, maybe Jesus, as you said, Jesus knowing all things, right? He knew that. Peter having the sword, he didn't tell Peter to put it away at that time. He didn't tell him to leave your sword home and don't bring your sword. He already knew that when they arrest him, this incident is going to take place. With the, what, what we're going to come to here, where the soldier, you remember one of the high priest servants, uh, Peter pulled out his sword and he was going to chop off the guy's neck, which I believe, but the guy ducked and he cut off his ears. And, you know, that, John didn't tell us that here. But this is the last miracle that Jesus performed. Because Jesus um, took the air and put it back on and was able to heal the, the servant of the high priest. So I'm just suggesting maybe in the, the foreknowledge of, of God and in the foreknowledge of Jesus Christ, he didn't tell Peter to leave his soul home because he probably saw that incident com- coming up. Because now, right now we have this as a testimony. Go ahead. I, I, I figured to... Um, <clears throat> crying... <clears throat> Sorry. Taking a sword was a part of the culture at that time. It was right. a part of the, the culture at that time. But in Roman domination, mm-hmm. it was a sort of thing that you secure. You, you didn't walk with it exposed. You walk with it secure. And I believe at times, probably when Jesus was not there, the disciples had to defend themselves against thugs or robbers and thieves. So at times they had to use their sword. You know? That, that is not in the picture of the scripture. Mm-hmm. But we can look into it because of the culture of the time and understand the way a life at that time. Yes, I believe that Jesus knew and he allowed them for that particular time. What will happen? It's like you can't carry a weapon. Because carrying a weapon is like, a, you could go to jail for that, right? Just as no. Okay, just as the law. Because there was under the Roman occupation at the time, and it was forbidden for the, the people that are under occupation to walk with any weapon. Yeah, but, but that's why the culture at that time permitted, the culture at that time um, permit them, uh, allow them to carry a weapon. But what I'm saying, it was concealed. Just like in our society today, 
um, the, the law say, you can take a weapon, you can carry a weapon, but that weapon must be licensed. Mm-hmm. And you're allowed to carry it. Now, if me and you now are thugs and robbers, we take our weapon, but it is concealed. We'll protect, we'll hide with that weapon and go along with it. Well, without, without cutting you off, even one of, one of Jesus' disciples was called the Zealot. And when a person was a Zealot back in those days, is somebody who believed in resisting the, um, the Roman authority. So, you know, as we said, um, maybe not all of the disciples, but some of the disciples, some people are saying that even Judas... Judas was expecting Jesus to, to, to raise up an army and defend himself. And maybe there, there could be also um, other disciples who have that um, same intention too. Because they, they were expecting Jesus to set up a kingdom. And you can't really set up a kingdom without, especially at that time, because they were under the control of the Romans. For him to set up a physical kingdom, he had us to overthrow um, the Romans. You know, so um, maybe all of that probably was going through um, their mind. But as, as I said before, Jesus never had any intention for them to start any physical confrontation with uh, the soldiers or with the, 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 the Romans, which were their enemies. Now, he said to, um, in verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his Right here, the servant name was Malchus. So uh, uh, it, there's a possibility that maybe this guy was closest to Jesus, and he probably was either he put his hand on Jesus, or he was making some kind of um, you know preparation to put his hand on Jesus, and he was closest to Peter. So what Peter did? Peter just pulled out his sword and he aimed for. Peter didn't try. He was trying. He wasn't trying to cut off the guy's ears. He was intended to chop off the guy, his neck. But apparently the guy probably, you know, he ducked and uh, his ear was sliced off. He sliced off the ear. And this is showing us here that John, he was an eyewitness. And John even, he recalled what happened, that the guy's ear was sliced off. And he even tell her it's his right ear. Somebody who wasn't there would say, well, you know... Um, Peter cut off one of the servants of the high priest's ear. But they won't be able to make exact reference to say, well, it's the right ear or it's the left ear. So this is telling us that this person is an eyewitness. This person was there. And also he gave us the name of the person that whose ear was cut off. He said it, it's Malchus. And this is going to come into play again later, later on as we go on. Now, hear what Jesus said in verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up. Uh, thy sword into the shield. Put away your sword. Put your sword back into the shield. So apparently Peter, he, he was secure. <laughs> he, he had it in a secure place. Whether it was exposed or not, we don't know. Put your sword back into the shield. The cup which my father had given me, shall I not drink it? So it's a, it's a rebuke Jesus is giving Peter here. And uh, Jesus is telling Peter, the cup that the Father prepared for him. And we, we, some of, sometimes we read these um, texts and we don't really understand when we see cup. We don't really go into details to study what cup means. But when we talk about the cup there, he's talking about judgment. He's talking about the suffering. He's talking about all of the, the, the trials and all of the hardship and all of the, well, the death the burial, the resurrection, all of that, God prepared it in a cup um, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And is God that prepared that? God had, is God who prepared death for Jesus? Sometimes when we say these things, some people might think, but that don't really sound like the God that they really um, saw or the God that they expect to saw because that don't sound too loving. Why would a father prepare death for his son? But God prepared death and he prepared suffering for his son. And Jesus bore all of that suffering and he bore death. Not for himself, but for us. For all of us. So that we could uh, be um, redeemed. And I like the part there where um, Jesus said to Peter, Put up thy sword into the shield. Put away your sword. And I'm thinking about you know, Peter trying to fight his own battle. 
And he was fighting the wrong people. He was using the wrong weapon. Peter was supposed to use that weapon. Jesus never in intended for Peter to, to use that weapon. He was fighting the wrong enemy. The person that he's supposed to fight was the devil, not against the Roman soldiers. And today, we see where a lot of times we try to fight our own battle. You know, we try to fight our own battle, and it's the same thing that Jesus is saying to us that he said to Peter, put away your sword. You know, sometimes in our marriage, in our home, we fight in with our sword, and the word is to us too. Put away your sword. God is saying to husband. God is saying to wives, put away your sword. Put away your sword. That, no, that's not going to work. Could you imagine you lying down next to your wife and she have a sword? Would you sleep next to you, uh, uh, a woman who have a sword? Or you lie down next to your husband? <laughs> anyway, by the way, happy Mother's Day to all the ladies. Would you lie down next to, as a wife, would you lie down, Sister Louis, would you lie down next to Brother Louis knowing that you have a sword? You have a sword, he lie down next to you, but you have a sword lying down there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, nobody won't do that. But the thing is, if, if you, if, if, if we go to bed, as the Bible said, if you go to bed angry and you, you know, you're so upset with your spouse, it's like lying down next to her with a sword. And the Bible is saying that we have to put away our sword. And when, when, you, when you're in, in a relationship with somebody, you can't expect to have sword. You, you have to put away a sword. You know, it means that that person is your friend. You're on the same team. You know, whether it's your children or your wife. For that matter, we as Christians, we're not supposed to carry no sword. We're not supposed to be armed and ready to attack people. That's not, that's not Christian. You know, we're supposed to drop, your, lay your weapon down. And we have to understand, as we keep on saying, anytime we try to fight and defend ourselves, you know what happened? The Lord not going to fight for us. The Lord not fighting for us anymore. No. Anytime you in, in a in a situation and you want to take on the situation yourself, Jesus can't fight for you. You have to just stand by, take a side. And that's the reason why we can't fight our own battle. I know the temptation does be there all the time. And a lot of times it seems as though we can do it better than the Lord. You never get yourself in a situation and you say, I, I know the Lord. You, 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 you know what the Bible says about waiting, waiting upon the Lord and let the Lord fight for you. But you just figure that you could handle this thing. I'm capable enough to handle it. And, you know, we, we, we just mess things up. But we can't really fight for ourselves. We can't defend ourselves. We have to let the Lord do our fighting, physical confrontation. You know, get it into heated argument and fighting with people and, you know, cursing with people and stuff like that. Anytime you're in a discussion, anytime you see somebody start to get excited in a discussion, even though it's the Bible, you try to tell somebody something about the Bible and people get in, you know, angry, you have to walk away. You have to, the Bible says we're not supposed to cast pearls before swine. And sometimes people say, well, I've I, I got to get across the point. No, you don't need to do that. If you don't want to hear or she don't want to hear, you leave them alone. Don't get, get into no argument. So we have to put away our sword. God expects us to live in peace. Live in peace with our brothers and our sisters. Praise the Lord. And uh, it tells us in verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the shield. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink? Jesus said he have to drink that cup that the father gave him. You know, we also, there are certain things that we have to face in life, you know. A lot of times we don't expect to hear these things. And sometimes we kind of get upset with, you know, ministers when they talk about these things. And they, we will say, well, He's not a minister of faith because he's telling us that certain things we're going to have to face. And, but it's just, it's just the truth. You see, just like how Jesus talked about this cup here, this journey that we are on, this pilgrim journey that we are on, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to face. There's a lot of things that are going to come into our lives. And when, when these things come into our lives, brethren, I want you to understand, it's not because you, you, are, you are some kind of sinner or you, you, you fail God, why, why these things come into your life? And the reason why these things come into our life, none of us exempt. 
is because we are living in a world of sin. Because we are living in a sinful world, bad things are going to happen to us. We have to understand we are going to meet with disappointment. You know, you, you, you'll meet up a situation when you go for a job and you tell yourself, you set your mind, you pray and you, you ask the Lord for that job. And you believe that you're supposed to get that job. Because you're a child of God, you're the king's kid and God, you have to give me that job. And you, you believe, you, you even start plan out where you're going to start to do, you're going to start tithing and all of that. And Lord, behold, you don't get that job. We have to be able to deal with these things, brethren. These things are going to come. And that's the reason why some people get discouraged and some people just, you know, get upset with God because they have things planned out and things didn't really work out the way that they expect it to work and they get upset. But brethren, sometimes bad things are going to happen to us. You know, there are times that we're going to lose kids. Sometimes, you know, our, our, our loved ones are going to pass away. I mean, I'm talking about young sons and daughters are going to pass away. What, what are you going to do? Let's suppose that in, in the will of God, God have it in his will that your child that you love, your beloved child that you love, is going to have to pass away. What are you going to do? You're going to just, well, how can God expect, how can God allow that to happen to me? I have a daughter that passed away. I was a prayer warrior back in those days, going to prayer meeting all the time, anointing my kids them in the night, laying hands on them, rebuking Satan in Jesus' name, say, telling Satan you don't have no authority over my home and all of that. One of my, my, well, my daughter, the only daughter I had, she passed away. And I don't have any explanation for that. You know, so things going to happen to us, brethren. But when these things happen, we have to, resolve in our mind, in our heart, that we are not going to give up. If death come into your family, you, have, you can't give up. If a sickness come into your family, you still can't give up. We have to be like Job. We have to be like Job, brethren. We have to hold on. We have to hold our integrity. Hold to your integrity. Sometimes the things that we're going through is just a test. It's a test. You know, to see, you know, well, not to, for God to see because God already know. For us to prove where we are with the Lord. So we, we have to hold on. We have to hold on. All right, in verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. So all of those soldiers, whether it was 200 or 700 or 1,000 men, with all of the um, police officers from the temple, they took Jesus and they bound Jesus. Could you imagine that? Let us suppose God allow you to be God or to be Jesus. Let us allow God allow you to be Jesus just for one day. Would you allow police officers to bong you? Would you allow, you know, people call you names? And If God allow you to be Jesus with all of his power, all of his sovereignty, for one day, none of us, none of us, mind you, still have the human nature. <laughs> still have the human nature. None of us will allow people to do us this thing. And here we see Jesus with all of that power. He was still able to, um, you know, harness that power and don't use that power to destroy um, um, people, to destroy the world. He could have been like the disciples um, when Jesus went into uh, uh, that village and they didn't receive him. Um, the two brothers said, let us call on fire and burn them up. Jesus could have just called on fire and burn up these people. You know, just the same way. You notice those verses below, uh, before, where when, they, um, when he asked them, whom do they seek? They said they seek Jesus. And as soon as they, he, he, he said, I am he, they all fall back backwards. You know, instead of throwing them down, he could have just let them stay there permanent. They could have just died permanent, but he didn't do that. So here he, he allowed them to handcuff him. To tie him up. <laughs> when you tie somebody up, it, it, it means that that person become helpless. You know, you take authority over them. Jesus allowed them to bong him and, you know, put him under arrest. And in verse 13, and led him away to Annas force. For he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. So, Annas was not the high priest. But Annas' son-in-law was the high priest. But what happened here is that Annas, this guy Annas, he was like the patriarchs of high priests. 
although he was not in office, the, the, the Jewish people had such high um, admiration and recognition for him that they still, even though he was not in office, they still regard him as the grandpapa of high priest. Because what was happening here in this time, um, the, the high priest, the high priest um, office in Israel at that time was more or less like it was sold to the highest bidder. Because when you go back in the Old Testament, you will see where the um, high priest was supposed to be from one family. It was supposed to be from the family of Aaron. And um, none of these guys that we are seeing here, um, Annas and um, Caiaphas, they were not from the high priest family of, Abraham, of Aaron. But what was happening here is that the Romans, what the Romans was doing, or what they did, because they were in control, they were selling um, the high priest's office to the highest bidder. And uh, this guy, Annas, he had um, um, five sons. Five of his sons, although he was not from the line of Aaron, five of his sons and one of his grandson plus his son-in-law was high priest because these men bought the office. And that's the reason why these men, they were all to kill Jesus because in those days when they bought that office of the high, uh, 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 the high priest's office, it means that these were the same people who were controlling all of the selling that was going on in the temple. So when Jesus go in the temple and overthrow the money changers and cast out all these people who were selling animals in the temple, it was this same family who was profiting from what was going on in the temple. And that's the reason why these guys, they set their mind that they were going to kill Jesus because it is believed that Jesus um, cleansed the temple maybe two or three times. And every time he go in the temple, he throw out these guys. And uh, they were, uh, Jesus was more or less um, interrupting their business. And uh, this, was a, this was a profitable business that they were doing here. And they were making tons of money. And what we are seeing here is that these men, as I said, they, they, they bought the office of the high priest. And it's like today. Today we have where, um, you know, to become an ordained minister. You know, there are places that you could go and you could buy it. You know, you go down to Canada Christian College or one of those colleges that um, have these courses. And uh, these colleges, they don't really care if you're born again. When you go to register in one of the Bible colleges in Toronto, they don't care if you're born again. No, they don't care about that. All they care is that you come in and you sign up for these courses. And one of these courses in my time when I was going was $350 for one. And you have to do 40-something of those courses before you can get your master's degree. And then they will um, give you ordination. I work in, you know, in garbage, working hard like what? Well, at the end of the day, I'm so tired. Sometimes I go in, in the, those classes and I, I just barely keep in my eyes open. And, you know, I, I didn't get to go to 40-something because I was too tired. So I went to... The, um, the dean of the college, and I said to him, I have a church, I have how much members and stuff like that. I'm not an ordained minister. When I have marriage to perform in my congregation, we have to get somebody from outside. I need to get an ordination license. And he told me, no. No, you got you to do those um, 40-something courses. And uh, what they want is the money. The money. You have to do that 40-something courses. And... Before they give you your ordination license, I saw that they had people who were there who was not born again. I know this guy from Guyana. He wasn't a Christian. He was, he, he, he was um, not Muslim. What the, the Hindu, yes. He was a Hindu. And he signed up in the college. And uh, he was doing sometimes six courses for, um, every semester. And I, well, I wasn't there when he graduated. But I believe, because he went all the way through, uh, you know, he's going to get his, um, his master's degree, and then they're going to ordain him. So what I'm saying is that just like all these um, people in the time of Jesus, they were buying the high, high priest's office. Today, they're selling the ordination. It's the same thing. If you want to become a doctor, a doctor of theology, 
they, they are guys who have connection, who you could go to them and you pay them $5,000, and uh, they, they see that you get your doctorate. As I told you guys that this um, bishop, he called me up and said, um, I could make you a doctor, man. You know, I said to him, man, this is my, I'm not even a nurse. <laughs> I'm not even a nurse. Much less, could you imagine? <laughs> I'm not even a nurse, and he want to make me a, a doctor. I got to pay him close to $5,000 to get this um, doctorate license. It, it has some people who will want it, but I don't really want that. What am I going to do with a doctorate license? Who is going to recognize me as a doctor? Me not no doctor. And uh, what people have to, have to understand, when you call yourself doctor and you're not a medical doctor, it's like the, 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 the priests in the Catholic Church, when we call them father, and we say that we're not supposed to call him father because, uh, according to the Bible, we're not supposed to call um, these earthly men who is not our biological father. We're not supposed to address them and give them the title as father. And when you address somebody who is not a medical doctor, somebody who have their doctorate in theology and you're calling them doctor this and doctor that, it's just like if you call him father. It's in the, when you study it, it's in the same category because that is forbidden. You never see in the, in the Bible where um, they said we're supposed to call a minister doctor. What kind of title do you say we're supposed to give to them? We call them pastors, evangelists. You could call them shepherd. You could call them leader. You could call them presbyter, elder. But the Bible never said to call anybody doctor. So these men were buying these office. They were selling it. And because of that, Annas, and we'll close there, Annas family held the high priest's office for more than 50 years because he had five of his sons who were um, at one time sitting in that office, one grandson and one son-in-law. And this was not according to the will of God because according to God's will, a person becoming high priest have to be connected to the line of Aaron. And none of these men were con connected to the line of Aaron, but because they had the money, they were able to buy the office and they were making back their money. They were selling all of these animals that was being sacrificed um, in, the, in the temple. They were selling these things and they were making money off of it. May the Lord bless us. We'll close there. Anybody have any comment or question that you want to ask before we pause? All of the ammunition and all of these things. And as he, he said there about the loading of money, you know, when they're lending out money, what they're doing, it's not, it's not their money they're lending out, you know. They, they, they're just writing how much they want to lend out on a piece of paper. And that becomes money. And the government really allowing them to do that. So that is the reason why, brethren, we can't put our trust in uh, men of this world. And the material goods that we have, we can't really put our trust in it. Because uh, all of these uh, is going to pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. And heaven and earth included all of your, your, your nice house, your fancy car, the, your bank account, all of that is going to pass away when Jesus returns. So, you know, we have to occupy until he comes. And don't get ourselves caught up in what is going on in the world. The hunger for material things and for wealth. And it's already penetrated the church. It's already penetrated the church. You know, where so much ministers become so greedy. And all they're talking about is to become prosperous. You know, prosperity is okay, but prosperity is just, a, it's just a dessert on the dish that God prepared for us. It's just one of the desserts that God put there for us. And uh, don't get yourself caught up. Yes, God wants to prosper you, but don't allow um, material things to control you. We're supposed to control material things. We're supposed to control wealth. We're supposed to control money. If you have money, you control it. Don't make money control you. God bless us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for your words today. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Continue to bless us as we come together, Lord, to open up your words. Place a hunger within our hearts for more of you. Be with us in our time of worship. We ask these favors in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Praise the Lord.